everyone and welcome to Wednesday night worship at home. I am Cindy Ward and I have been a member of Galilee for a little over 10 years now and I currently serve as the council president. Um, and I am here with my friend and, and neighbor, Chrissy. Hi, I'm Chrissy Anderson. Um, I currently serve as the worship uh, ministry team lead which just a little insight, our worship ministry team lead is going to, um, the team is going to change names. It's going to be worship, music, and technology starting soon. And I've been at Galley probably since 1983. My parents and I moved here to Pasadena and we joined them. And uh, we're in our lovely neighborhood. We're outside of our community pool and our community clubhouse, as you can see. And our lovely videographer, Paula, is also uh, one of our neighbors. So we all decided to do it together as a neighborly thing. But oh, if you're interested in, in joining to do a worship Wednesday at home, please just check out, um, get in touch with Pastor Matt, which there'll be an email here somewhere that just get in touch with him and he'll get you on the list to do worship at home. And it's very easy. It's super easy. Anybody can do it. Grab a friend, grab a neighbor, grab a family member. You can do it from home. You can do it in your neighborhood. You can do it at a park, anywhere that you feel at home. Um, it would be great. We'd love to have you join us and, and share the worship home service. So let's. Welcome to Worship at Home. Welcome. Our prayer of the day. Almighty God, you caused your holy word to be written for our instruction so that our lives may be lived in accordance with your will. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may carefully hear your word and build our lives on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, that your love may flow through us to all whom you love, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 4 through 12. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, when men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit, they refuse to return. I have paid attention and listened, but they have not spoken rightly. No man reliance of his evil, saying, What have I done? Everyone turns to his own course, like a horse plunging headlong into battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her times, and the, true, and the turtle dove, swallow and crane, keep the time of their coming. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall not be shamed, shall not be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to conquerors. Because from the least to the greatest, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed ab abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among the fallen when I pr punish them. They shall be overthrown, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our second reading is from Romans 9. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our third reading for this evening is Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 48. 
And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that not you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace? But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, thank you to Chrissy and Cindy for leading us in our worship home this evening. It's great not only to see you at church on weekends, but also be able to join together on these special Wednesday midweek services. And thank you also to Mr. Carver for delivering and sharing a wonderful message in just a few moments and to our awesome musicians at Galilee. I thank you to Rob and Wade, Melissa and Jan and so many others that serve so diligently week after week, leading our congregation in song and praise and in glory to our God. Now, tonight's catechism reading deals with confession, but you realize confession isn't just by itself. You, confession is intricately linked to absolution. They must go together, law and gospel. And so Luther teaches us to ask certain questions and then provides the answers. Tonight, the question is how Christians should be taught to confess. So what is confession? Luther teaches us confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness from the pastor or from God himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that by it, our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. Now the question comes up, well, what sins should we confess? Luther says, before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Now, Luther says, which are these sins? And he teaches us to consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father or a mother, a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife or a worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent or wasted anything or done any harm? Now the encouragement from all this is if you have, come to your pastor, come to me. Confess those sins as you would to God himself and hear his words of forgiveness and absolution totally and completely through the blood and righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. My role is to hear sins and to forgive, absolve sins. And God has placed me here for that role. It's a gift he gave to the disciples to carry out in the ministry of his congregation, his people, his community, until that day that he returns. So we might always know that we are forgiven, that we are loved, and that we are redeemed by the blood of our Savior. Take it away, Chris. Thank you to Miss Chrissy Anderson and Miss Cindy Ward for hosting this week's Wednesday Worship at Home. Thank you, as always, to Pastor Matt for our beautiful catechism lesson. And last but not least, the Galley Singers for this week's hymn. And as we join together in today's worship, let's, before we join together in today's message, let's join together in a brief time of prayer. Heavenly Father, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and of peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to the one true saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lips, and from the lips to the life that as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So now, we're gonna, this week we're going to be talking about the gospel reading. And with gospel reading this week from Luke, a day or two after the events recorded in that gospel reading, the Lord told his disciples, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. What God is going, says is going to happen, will happen. This is not only true of his promises of happiness and joy and of his forgiveness and his mercy, but it's also true of his, his promises of suffering, demise, and destruction. So human beings often do not learn in the easiest ways or the most direct ways, but usually they learn in the most difficult and painful ways possible. And the children of Israel are no different. They often had to learn things the 
hardest of ways. And here we are even 3,000 years later doing, we're no different, doing the same thing. When Jacob's sons allowed themselves to be influenced by the immorality of the Canaanites, God, by means of a seven-year famine, forced them into the land of Egypt. When the Israelites became content living there and refused to return to the land that he, on oath, promised to give them, God caused a new dynasty of pharaohs to arise and enslave them. And though God eventually delivered them by the blood of Passover lambs and the water of the sea, and appointed for them a faithful leader in Moses to guide them to the promised land, they complained and threatened to return to their former lives. They took two years to reach the promised land, only to turn their backs to it, because the land was populated with giants. So God the Father essentially said to them, Okay, since you still haven't learned, again, have another 38 more years of wandering in the desert. And with that action, God caused everyone who was 20 years or older when they left Egypt to perish in the wilderness. But those whom he allowed to live in the promised land did not remain faithful to him for very long either. And eventually, their descendants were carried off into captivity. Time and time again, the Israelites responded to God's faithfulness with their unfaithfulness, even though he was showing his grace. They presumed that because they were God's chosen people, God would just continue to bless them despite all of their sinful ways. And with that ideology, they were very wrong. God is patient, but he will not tolerate sinful behavior forever. Now, as Jesus drew near to Jerusalem on what we now call Palm Sunday, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Forty years later, his promise of demise and destruction came true as the armies of Rome destroyed Jerusalem, slaughtering most of the people and sold the ones who managed to survive into slavery. God's word did not pass away then, and God's word still will not pass away to this day either. Though the Lord has blessed this nation of the United States of America in so many ways over her 246 years, many of her people have gone the way of his Old Testament. They support the destruction of unborn babies, yet will fight, even sacrificing their own lives, to prevent the killing of animals for food, animals over which God has given us dominion. Americans have gone to great lengths to permit homosexual marriages, but then they allow traditional marriages between men and women to be destroyed through divorce, selling it as an easy way out of a bad situation. Many of our political leaders, our national leaders, they ignore the lawlessness that plagues our cities and our towns, and they even encourage it in some cases, claiming it as a right provided under our Constitution. And then there are our nation's citizens, the common folk, who statistically know little of history and math and even less of what God commands, only to turn around and spew hatred and disrespect instead of praying for those in authority, as we're commanded to do by God. All this is the evil fruit of a culture that despises God and his word, a culture that deems it right to close churches down during a pandemic when people need God's assurances and threatens the faithful who speak out against it. We have all watched it go down over the last three years. Does it not concern you, though, that Muslims and anarchists are allowed to shout words of hate under the right of free speech? But Christians are constantly told to remain silent about their faith, lest they offend someone. And make no mistake, many Christians have been led astray by the godlessness that exists in America today, even support those who promote it because they too have forgotten the time of their visitation. Seeing once again the devastation God allowed to come upon ancient Jerusalem, I fear what might soon happen to this country. And... If she keeps going down this evil path, God only knows what's going to happen. But we've seen it over time and time again occur in the Old Testament. People turn their back to God 
God turns his back on them. But through all of that, there is hope. And that hope is expressed to us as Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. For God is a God of grace. While his holy law condemns all those who reject him, his gospel promises grace and blessing to all who believe. So remember, Jesus wept over Jerusalem, willingly entering the city to be given over to his enemies to die on a cross a week later so that he may redeem sinful man from eternal death. He did this to give us a new life and a blessed communion with him in the kingdom of heaven. He set out to sacrifice himself, bringing an end to his early earthly body, only to rise again and ultimately ascend into heaven. This is what we, I often refer to as the propitiation. This is the substitutional perfect sacrifice for our sins. He did this for us as a gift paid for with his blood. It's through his salvation and his forgiveness poured over us in our holy baptism, fed to us in his body and his blood that we take part of in a weekly feast that we who deserve God's endless painful destructive wrath come to peace with God he who believes this will not perish but have everlasting life God has promised us this and he will deliver upon his promises just as he did in the Old Testament this is a testament to our faith since this faith we receive by way of the Holy Spirit comes to us by hearing his word and this forgiveness that is bestowed upon us in the holy sacraments, our Lord in his grace and his mercy does this, does to his church what he did to the temple. He cleanses it of those who desire to abuse it for their own personal gain. And by the grace of God in Christ Jesus, we are members of his church, both in his body and in the physical space where we gather to praise, honor, and glorify him and his name on a weekly basis. We belong to a church whose goal it is not to grow, not to influence public opinion, not to offer all kinds of social activities, even though all that stuff happens, but we're there to share the good news, to share with every sinner we meet, the, the, every sinner that we meet, the news that Jesus Christ came for their salvation and their life and for our salvation and for our lives. Here we teach and we preach that Jesus Christ is our savior given for us for the forgiveness of sins in which, which is the only way we can overcome the godless culture in which we live. Whether that culture be here and now, 500 years ago in Germany, a thousand years ago in England, or more than 3,000 years ago in the wilderness. The question is, are you willing to do what it takes to preserve this nation? The people of Jerusalem who were once welcomed, who once welcomed the Romans and invited these people into their houses and homes, they were not willing to do whatever it took to preserve that land promised to them by God. And because of that, their temple was destroyed, never to be rebuilt. In fact, even though the sovereign borders of Jerusalem were reinstated in 1949, a mosque now stands where the temple once was. Let that be a warning to all of us upon whom the grace of God is shining brightly today. To whom more is given, more is required. We have the words of life preached to us in their truth through his word weekly, and we have many opportunities to hear it. We receive the holy sacraments administered to us according to their institution in Jesus Christ every Saturday and Sunday at our 4.38 a.m. and 10.45 services, and by the Holy Spirit and the faith that he works in us through the world, through the words shared with us but today by Miss Cindy and Miss Chrissy, we know the time of our visitation. That's why we are joined here in this virtual environment today. We're here to seek the things that bring peace to us. Those things that are in love, in the love, the forgiveness, the grace, and the shepherding we receive through Jesus Christ. Come to think of it, the Jews at the time turned to Jesus as they welcomed him into the city, turned to him as they welcomed him into the city, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. But just a few moments after that, they turned their backs on him. They turned him over to Pontius Pilate to be hung on a cross. And 40 years later, they lost it all. Their city and their nation fell. And we pray for this not to happen to us. And in doing so, it would serve us well to heed these words God issued through the sacred writer to the Hebrews. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised 
is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. In Christ's precious name we pray tonight. Amen. prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we close our time this evening, I want to again thank everyone for being a part of it, but also say if you'd like to be part of our worship at home, be one of the leaders, let Miss Paula Ellison know, uh, or else let me know, or Mr. Carver, and we'll make sure to try to squeeze you in the end of our season this year, which ends up right just before Thanksgiving, just before Advent. And then we'll have a break during our Advents and Christmas seasons and come back together into the new year and then throughout the year until Lent and then at following Lent to carry through our summer season. I got to say, having this worship at home is great when we're traveling and when we're not nearby to be able to have a, a midweek devotion or even a worship together. So let's close with the Lord's blessing. Hear now the word of our Lord to place his name upon his people. And he says to do it this way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Have a wonderful evening. Know that I love you and aloha. Thank you for joining us in our worship service today. If you are in the Pasadena, Maryland area and are looking for a church home, we would love to meet with you and give you more information on our family here at Galilee. Please give us a call here at the telephone number below. We would love to hear from you. If you are not in the Pasadena, Maryland area, but you are looking for a church home, again, please let us know so we can do our best to get you pointed in the right direction. Thank you to everyone who helped and participated during our service this weekend. We are truly blessed to have such a generous and faithful congregation devoted to sharing the word of Jesus Christ with you. And last but not least, if you enjoyed today's service, please click the like or the subscribe buttons to let us know that you enjoyed it. Please leave us comments if you so desire and sign up to receive notifications for our Saturday, our Sunday, and our Wednesday worship at home services. Have a blessed day. And God be praised. Thank you to Miss Chrissy Anderson and Miss Cindy Ward. Wow. I don't know what the next part is. I should look at this. Uh, oh, it's confession. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Oh. Amen. Woo! 
Did it do it, Ray? Right? Easy peasy. She's not even gonna touch it. <laughs>